Um, this is my favorite time of year when I get to come to BaselCon and talk about the awesome thing we've built, and this year it's especially awesome. I'm going to be talking about Starlarkification for tasks, um, uh, how to go past make serve. And uh, you may know our Marvin character here, he's our mascot. I've got three new engineers on his team who are going to help to tell my story today. Um, so their names are Nina, Perry, and Ivan. Um, they are at the end of their Bazel migration. So they've already written their blog post and done their BaselCon talk, and so it's very exciting. But something is still not right because there's a bunch of scripts that are still hanging out in their repo. They have things to install tools and, and figure out how the local dev is supposed to work and CICD. Did they do the migration incorrectly? Like, why did they end up with these things? Um, so let's look at a few examples of the scripts that are still sitting in their repo. So they've got this bash script, and sorry, I know there's a lot of code here, but I'll, I'll give you the short version, which is that there's some brew installs going on, because if you don't do the right brew installs, then your build's not going to work, right? So hopefully this is up to date. Um, they've also got another bash script that's checked into a special magical path in the repo called tools slash Bazel, right? Which is, as we all know, a naughty place that we can script around Bazel and make whatever things happen that we need to. And so there's some startup options being set and maybe some AWS credentials and things that are going to you know, bust the analysis cache like, like we do. Um, they've still got a make file. Um, and this is because they didn't manage to translate all of the workflows yet. So like there's one team in the repo that's like, no, you can't take this away yet. It doesn't quite work the way we want under Bazel. So like our linting and deployment workflows are still sitting in here. And then, you know, some of those seem comical, but you've all got one of these, which is your CI YAML, which is also wrapping Bazel, and it's got some logic. And you see some of this is packaging, but it doesn't pass the same flags to tar as the other one. So this is probably where a lot of us end up, okay? Um, so what does this mean to these people? Um, so let's start with Nina. She's, she's the new person on the team, and um, her problem is that she wants to show up to work and be a competent new employee on the team and not come across as a total idiot, except when she tries to follow the readme, like stuff on her computer is not working, right? Um, she, did she follow the readme? Well, it may, maybe it was out of date, right, or the wiki. So, and, and this is, this is all of us are like this person when we go to a different part of the code base or we switch to a different team at our company and stuff is set up differently. Um, so her problem is often, number one, she, like the CI is green, that's this little basil box in the background, but then on her computer, it's not working. So it must be her fault, because CI is green. But then on the other hand, after she submits her first PR, the CI is red, but is green locally on her machine, right? So is there some weird interaction happening with the CI environment? Maybe the flags aren't set the same locally and on CI. That's a possibility, right? So. Um, Let's go on to our next person. So this is Perry. He's a product engineer. He's seasoned. He loves to just like sling features. Now that he's using AI half the time, he's, uh, you know, he gets to take more coffee breaks and be even more productive. But then his AI agent is just like constantly running into workflow issues, and so is he, that slows him down, right? So his velocity is slower because of issues with the way these scripts are set up. Uh, and then finally, we have somebody on the dev infra team. This probably represents a lot of us in the room. So this is Ivan, and his task is to improve the developer infrastructure for their whole company. And remember that make file I showed you? Man, that kills him because he can't get that team to get rid of it, but he also can't make changes that break them. And so it's really hard for him to have impact in the organization when there's not homogeneity in how Bazel is getting executed in all these different contexts. Okay, so what did they do wrong in their migration? Nothing. They are using Bazel right, but Bazel is not enough because it's missing a task runner. Okay, task runner is the overall concept I'm trying to, sh to show here. And to illustrate that, let's look at what Bazel is good at doing. Okay, it's good at doing only two things. Loading an analysis phase, which gives you a dependency graph and an action graph. It's also good at the execution phase, which populates your Bazel out tree with artifacts. And if I hand wave a little bit, um, you know, test exit codes are just another exit or another artifact that lives in Bazel out. So like, it's good at testing only in the sense that it can build the exit code of a test runner. Uh, but then there's a much longer list of things that it's just never going to be able to do, right? So setting up the environment I showed, creating and updating build files, Gazelle does that, but Bazel doesn't. Um, configuring your IDE, writing files back to the source tree, which you know Google says you shouldn't do. Um, performing actions that need the entire repo as an input, you would never want to have like an all files file group that touches the whole repo, uh, and so on. So lots of examples, and I'm sure you have some of these in scripts in your repo as well. Um, Another example is Bazel Run, which seems simple enough. It's actually a workflow around Bazel Build in disguise, and it's been broken since 2017 when we tried to get the right working directory. Fortunately, you notice it is fixed in Bazel 9, so like Bazel Run is, is maybe, it, maybe it's fixed all the way. Um, 
So what I'm getting to here is if you go to the Bazel website and you look down here at this little section and it says endlessly extensible, I would argue that it's only extensible in the sense that it can uh, accept rules that produce more outputs. Um, we would like it to be extensible also in the sense of running tasks that surround Bazel, that orchestrate multiple Bazel calls. And we would like that to be in Starlark because it's a language that we've all been very happy to learn as we've interacted with Bazel. And so what we want here is a Starlark dialect that lets us run tasks. And so this is what we're announcing this year is what we call aspect extension language, which allows you to do just that. And let me show you a few examples. Um, first of all, uh, we've got this new GitHub org that is just a collection of these extensions. Um, I've written a few. Uh, we would love to have others of you write more of these and upstream them to this, re to this org, makes them easy to find. We can also tag GitHub repos that live anywhere so that you can let people know if you've got one of these extensions. Um, this is a, you know, it's, it's still pre-release, so if you look in this org today, you'll probably see some mistakes, and uh, we're gonna be working on that over the next few weeks. Um, so there's, there's a couple extension points. One of them, I'm glad Jay is right up here in the front. Gazelle is awesome, and uh, if you don't know how to write a, a Gazelle extension yourself, Fortunately, a lot of the time, there's already one available for you. But sometimes there's not. And rules shell is a good example, because if you've tried Bazel 9, you've noticed that all of a sudden, all of your SH binary targets fail, unless they have load statements. Um, and what, and there's, there's no gazelle extension for shell. And it's actually pretty short, and maybe it doesn't sort of need one. Um, so in fact, using aspect extension language, there's a hook we can use, gazelle rule kind, where we declare SH binary to come from a certain location. Uh, and then we write, uh, we have, a, we have a, a gazelle extension called Orion, which is really just a Starlark bridge that allows us to specify which are the source files that we want to operate over. And then finally, the implementation function. This looks a lot like Starlark you would write to write a rule, right? Um, the implementation function is just saying which targets you want to create. Um, and then this is just bu built inside of a gazelle extension, so the result of this goes back to gazelle to write into the build files. Um, and so this is the sort of thing that's possible. And in fact, this is from the, the unit test that we run. Um, so we just generate a shell script, we run Bazel run gazelle, and then we can run Bazel run hello, like we expect, right? Build file generation works. But we didn't have to, to learn the, as many APIs. Okay. Um, the next extension point is tasks. Uh, and I'll show several examples here. And sorry, there's a bunch of code. Um, you can look through the slides later. I'll just tell you the highlights. So for one example, um, I came to BazelCon last year and talked about rules lint which allows you to run uh, an aspect over your existing library targets to collect lint results and then display them, which is exactly a workflow. Um, so what we do in this task, we declare the task. Again, this looks very much like if you were to write a rule, right? It takes an implementation, and then it has the command line arguments as instead of attributes, so it says what you're allowed to pass on the command line to lint. Then it has an implementation function, which is essentially some flags, and then some conditionals that look at whether it's interactive. And then magically on line 11, we do ctx.bazel.build. Because now we're outside of Bazel, and so in Starlark, we can do builds. Okay? Notice on line 13, we're saying events equals true. And so what that means we can do is listen on the build events as they come in. Still right here in Starlark, like I'm processing if I see a named set of files from the, Bazel, from the build event protocol, I can grab out the file paths, right? And for linting, those file paths are the output of the aspect that tells me what the lint results were and so I can print them. And so you have access to you know, standard out, standard error, and so that's how this interacts with the user on their terminal. Cool. Um, a fancier example, let's say that, uh, so obviously we've written some APIs in the Starlark host that you can interact with, but if there's APIs missing from that, you can actually load your own um, using WASM. So in this example, I want to be able to use Buildozer. I want to be able to reuse it, right? And a lot of us have written Go tooling because Go is the language in which you can access a lot of these common Bazel utilities like Buildozer. So we just wrapped it on line nine there with a Go Wasm export, uh, just saying that the name of the function is going to be edit. We build it with a Go binary that has Wasm as its target. And now in Starlark, I can actually uh, call out to Buildozer. So this is a function called build tools that's just going to be able to call Buildozer the path to the WASM binary is there. Um, and then the way I can use that, uh, we're all about to hear Malta's talk on rules image, so I could actually make a Buildozer script to like, add rules image to my module.bazel file. I could write a whole migration that just runs as a command. I write the migration in Starlark, much more principled than any of the wrapper scripts that you've written. Um, this one's definitely too long to read. This one's very cool, and I encourage you to check out um, on the run repo under the aspect extensions org. Um, Shaheen put this together. So this is Bazel multi-run. So multi, uh, I, I made fun of Bazel run earlier. Of course, it only takes one target. 
in this case, we can pass multiple targets to Bazel Run, and it will actually open up like a PTY screen that splits your terminal so you can see all the servers running next to each other, um, which is really cool. And this one uses another WASM binding to a small little Rust program that he wrote around a crate that provides exactly that sort of terminal experience. Um, we can also re-implement coverage, which I, you know, I, all of us have probably looked at coverage and wondered, like, why does Bazel even, like, try? Um, <laughs> sorry. There's been a lot of work on coverage. It doesn't work great. It has like an LCOV tool that's built in that runs in Java. You can still use Bazel coverage. I re-implemented it as a task that wraps Bazel test, and now I have much more control over, do I want to have LCOV merging? Do I want to just show the report? Do I want to talk to the version control system, find out which files you've changed, and then only show incremental coverage? All of those things are now possible without having to write an awkward script around Bazel. So, that is all the time I have right now. We made a little cartoon book so that those of you with kids at home can go home and tell them all about the aspect extension language using colorful and, um, and very, very simple language. Um, shout out to our sales uh, account executive, Jared, for the text on this. It gives me credit for illustrations, but you all know that's not true. I had AI do it. Um, you can also, on the back of that, it's got a QR code. So we've got these little Marvin characters. He comes and saves the build, and I would love to toss a couple of these if anybody wants to raise their hand and make this Oh, you're so far away back there. Okay. Oh, almost. Okay, one over. Can you just pass that back? Okay, excellent. Thank you very much. Please give us a try. Um, check out aspect.build slash AXL, and we would love to host some of your extensions.